Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. On April 20th, an explosion on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico killed 11 workers, injured several others. It's also created what could become a massive ecological disaster as oil continues to leak into the water and threaten the Gulf's coastal communities. Mike Tidwell is the founder of Chesapeake Climate Action Network and also author of Bayou Farewell, The Rich Life and Death of Louisiana's Cajun Coast. And always, as always, we'd like to say thank you to the sponsor of our web show, Dove. Hey, Mike, thanks for coming in. It's nice to meet you. My pleasure. So, you know, it's so interesting. When we first started reporting about this explosion on the oil rig, I remember actually breathing a sigh of relief and thinking, wow, crisis averted. This is not going to be a huge environmental uh, issue. Fast forward, you know, a week or 10 days, and suddenly we're talking about it in catastrophic terms. How did we get from there to here? Well, it's a great question. I think the uncertainty factor is one of the scariest things about this whole thing. Um, I don't think that British Petroleum really knows what's happening. I think they've struggled to even quantify how much oil is coming out. We now know that it's approximately maybe 5,000 barrels a day, which can quickly accumulate to be worse than the Exxon Valdez uh, spill. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Part of it is because this is a mile underneath the surface of the ocean. I mean, we've never had a gusher like this, a spill this big, this deep in, in deep water, a mile down. So they're dealing with utter darkness, incredible pressure levels, just very, very tough conditions to even know how much is coming out, much less cap it. And, and of course, leaks were developing one after the other after the other, with, I guess, the most recent one occurring, I believe it was last Wednesday, mm -hmm. when everyone was sort of like, this is going to be really, really serious. What kind of safeguards? There are safeguards, obviously, in place, technical uh, sort of procedures that ostensibly will prevent this from happening, right? Well, I, I think the big problem is uh, BP and many of the other major oil companies in the Gulf just never, it, it's sort of a, a failure of imagination. They just couldn't imagine that you would have an out-and-out -out gusher like this, that there were so many safety procedures, there were so many people whose judgment was constantly, you know, their attention was constantly being brought to the safety issue to shut off valves to keep this from happening. And there was, you know, multiple levels of failure, human judgment, equipment failures. You know, we, we may never know exactly what, but a lot went wrong in a way that outstripped even the imagination of the oil company. So we obviously have to do better, but this level of gusher, I think, simply tells us that, you know, there are certain things that we can't regulate away. You know, there are certain catastrophes when, you, when you're dealing with oil drilling and exploration at this volume, and I think that's part of it. Americans don't understand how big the operation is. 4,000 platforms in the Gulf, 35,000 different wells, punctures into the seafloor. Um, you know, a huge amount of our oil is coming from this region, and if the volume is that big, sooner or later there's going to be judgment failures, human error, equipment failure, and we now know the consequences can be catastrophic. Is there enough blame to go around as often is the case, like in the banking and financial crisis, or do you think the blame squarely lies on the shoulders of BP? Well, BP clearly, does, you know, has to be looked at first. You know, why did the shutoff valve not work? Why didn't they have a, re a remote shutoff valve the way they require them in Brazil and Norway so that if, if, if on the spot you can't stop it, you can stop it through acoustic, acoustic waves from a distance? Um, but really, I think this is a failure of U.S. energy policy. I mean, we are so dependent on oil. We are so dependent on such a large volume of oil, even as climate change intensifies, even as sea level rises, even as hurricanes get bigger, we continue to be addicted at such a profound level um, that we make inevitable these sort of uh, negative consequences. If you really want to look at the long-range way we prevent spills like this in the future, we have to use less oil. We have to switch, for example, wind power. You know, if you imagine an offshore wind farm of 100, 200 big windmills, if a hurricane were to come and knock down every one of them, just knock them down, there would not be one gallon of pollution emitted because it's clean energy. So, and part of it, part of it is just our national energy policy has failed to get us off of this stuff. Having said that, you know, while we're in the transition, if you believe we are transitioning to, to greener energy or to a better energy policy, you know, the, the need for oil is, is you can't refute. And obviously, the U.S. buys more than 12 million barrels of oil a day from other countries. So domestic production 
is also an important component to any, any energy policy while the transition, if if you believe that that should be made, is being made? Well, we certainly can't go and shut down every um, oil platform in, in the United States uh, because of one spill. That's just not going to happen. Politically, it's impossible, and our economy can't tolerate it. But the transition must happen and can happen faster. And so we should be having policies that promote offshore wind. Thankfully, ironically, just a week after right, uh, Cape Cod, th that's right. You have the Cape Wind project that was approved by the Department of Interior. There's going to be, you know, 450 megawatts of wind uh, capacity there. 150,000 homes can be powered by that. We need more of that and less of the drill, baby, drill, because that gets a spill, baby, spill. Well, having said that, President Obama recently announced that he wants to do additional offshore uh, oil drilling in, in selected areas. How do you think this will impact that decision? Because this came right, you know, really quickly on the heels of that policy change. Well, President Obama has already said in the wake of the Gulf um, oil spill disaster that uh, there can be no drilling and no exploitative drilling until we figure out what happened. Well, and yes, but but I guess do you think that it, he'll reverse his decision? I think he should. I think it was a mistake to encourage more drilling to begin with. We haven't done enough with green energy. We haven't done enough with efficiency. Europeans use half the energy per capita as Americans. The Japanese use half the energy per capita. And they have wonderful, convenient Western lifestyles. Clearly, we can do better in this country. If every car and truck in America 10 years from now, so we give Detroit 10 years, every car and truck is, was a hybrid like my Toyota Prius today, we cut our uh, gasoline use in half. So clearly conservation and efficiency can get us on that track. We're not moving fast enough. We need a carbon cap from Capitol Hill uh, and we need to move faster instead of drill baby drill. That is a failed policy and you know the oil industry keeps saying you know this is regrettable but it's part of the cost of doing business. I think in the next few weeks we'll find out how much of that cost Americans are really willing to tolerate. I want to talk to you since you're an expert on sort of the coastal land uh, in the Gulf coast region about the, the environmental impact on wildlife there and, and, and sort of the importance of the marshlands that are quickly disappearing. But before I do that, I want to ask you, because I know in, in the updated version of your book, Bayou Farewell, you wrote an epilogue about Katrina. Uh, some people are comparing the government's response to this to Katrina. In fact, Mike Huckabee, former governor of Alabama, of course, said, uh, Arkansas, rather, sorry, sorry, Governor Huckabee, said, if Katrina was George Bush's responsibility, this is Barack Obama's responsibility. Do you think that analogy is fair? Well, I know that uh, I've been following coastal Louisiana issues. I've been down there. I have very dear friends uh, for the last decade, and I, I, I was very close to people who were, who were affected by Katrina. And if you ask the people of Louisiana, as I have, after Katrina and the oil spill, you know, what's the difference? They'll tell you that there were, you know, the president came sooner. There are more federal resources um, after the oil spill. Um, is everyone happy? No. But Katrina was really, a, 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 as we all know, we saw it on television, a real failure of relief supplies, of relief of resources from the federal and state government. I think the scale has been very different. Um, but the, the, the oil spill isn't over yet. So, you know, we can't quite compare them because we're still, we, there's still a test before us to see how well we can deal with this but, catastrophe. But do you think the government was as prepared as it should have been for the worst case scenario? In other words, I know Janet Napolitano, the director of Homeland Security, has, has gotten some some pushback for the fact that she didn't really get the Department of Defense involved until fairly late in the game as we saw that more and more oil gushing into the water off the coast. Um, so, so in your view, was the response really um, appropriate well, to I, the situation? I think the difference between Katrina and this, uh, this oil spill is that Katrina was something you could see on satellites, you could measure the wind speeds, she came in, you could measure the surge tide, and then you saw the flooded city, okay? You knew that the problem was right before your eyes. This, for, for the first seven to ten days of this oil spill, 
the federal government really didn't have accurate information from the oil company. The oil company didn't know what they were dealing with. They, they weren't revealing how much oil was coming out. So it's, it's sort of hard for your government, which was held hostage to the information coming from the oil company, to, to know the scale. Now we seem to know. We know that it could be a hemispheric oil spill. I mean, this could flow into the Gulf Stream and come up the East Coast. And I think now the federal government is fully alerted, uh, but the test is still there. And I think the really important point is when you're drilling for oil at this scale, I mean, Americans, you don't have any idea. If you go out in the Gulf of Mexico right now, there are 4,000 platforms. They look on nautical charts like stars in the sky. I mean, there's so many of them out there that they literally form coincidentally constellations. Like instead of a big dipper, you'll have a, a boat captain will say, I'm passing the bunny ears on my way to the barbecue pit. It's like a galaxy of platforms. It, it, they're like, What's the difference between a platform and a well? Because um, there are 35,000 wells in the Gulf. There are 35,000 wells. And what, ha what happens is each platform can drill several wells, can make several punctures in the seafloor. So you have 35,000 sources of oil and gas coming out into 4,000 permanent structures, 3,000 ton structures with giant concrete legs. And it's like a, it's like a, a, a space colony. And when you get a sense of how many are out there, you understand the volume and the scale means that sooner or later, again, human beings are involved, you're going to have human error and you're going to have spills. And if we, if we want to prevent that and we want to reduce that risk, we have to think of alternatives to oil instead of just trying to regulate. Um, you can't regulate away human error. Yeah, but at the same time, we have to kind of deal with the cards we're dealt for now anyway, you know, and I think people could agree with you, but there also have certain pr precautions and measures should be in place for all these, this galaxy of, of platforms that you describe. And Image CPR tweeted us a question, why doesn't BP have a system, I think you sort of answered this, but why doesn't BP have a system in place to stop oil spills instantly? Well, uh, that's a good question. Again, in, in Norway and Brazil, they have these, these, these devices that if, if, the, if the platform collapses, you have a catastrophic collapse, and there's no one on the platform to, to turn any valve to, to stop the oil from coming up, you can do it remotely. You can do it from Why the shoreline. Why do you have that technology, in uh, your opinion? It Was it expensive? It costs like a half a million dollars Per, per emergency shutoff. I mean, it doesn't seem like that much money when we're now looking at tens, maybe a hundred billion dollars in impacts if worst case scenario happens from the spill. But in, in other oil nations, they require it. BP fought against this regulation. Other oil industry folks did. They said, we're regulated enough. Again, failure of imagination. They couldn't comprehend a complete collapse and a gusher like this because it hadn't happened like this before. Isn't uh, BP like this big sort of, it, didn't it paint itself or doesn't it paint itself as kind of the environmental oil company? Well, for a while there, BP, they don't say it anymore, but for a while they were saying BP stands for Beyond Petroleum. And BP did invest in solar energy. In fact, on my roof in Maryland, I have solar panels made by British Petroleum on my roof that are collecting sun power and powering my house. Uh, but it was still a very small fraction of their total investments. They still make, you know, multi-billion dollar profits every year on oil. They continue to invest in oil at a rate hundreds of times greater than they invest in alternatives. And hopefully this, again, this oil spill will change not only the nation's attitude toward fossil fuels, but, you know, the industry itself. I mean, BP and Exxon should become energy companies, not oil companies. Get into wind and solar. Do you think this is going to increase gas prices? Well, um, that's a good question. Again, I, I think that in terms of just the, the volume of the oil that is produced in this country, the Gulf of Mexico, when, when you have 35,000 wells, this is just it's one 19 of It's 19% of the U.S.'s refining capacity is in the Gulf. Right. Yes. Um, and, and this one well is a very small fraction of, of that. So it's unlikely to affect uh, gasoline prices, but there have been lots of reports the last few days saying that this could affect shrimp prices, oyster prices, you know, even the cost of coffee and bananas if it goes into the, into the Mississippi River and these tankers have to be cleaned of oil from their hulls and that's a delay. So it's going to cause prices to go up almost inevitably. You know, the, the marshlands were endangered really prior to this and prior to Katrina. Um, you wrote in your book, in, which was published in 2003, quote, every 10 months, even without hurricanes, an air area of Louisiana land equal to Manhattan turns to water. That's 50 acres a day, a football field every 30 minutes. Why, is, why was that happening and why is it continuing to happen? 
Coastal Louisiana is the fastest disappearing landmass on Earth, and it's because we put levees on the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River no longer floods. Um, it, it goes right to the edge of the continental shelf, and it deposits sediments and nutrients from two-thirds of, of America. That The mud, basically, that flows into the Mississippi now just goes into the deep ocean of the, of the Gulf of Mexico instead of, in past years, flooding and depositing those alluvial soils in coastal Louisiana. You know, that whole ragged soil of the Louisiana boot is basically just a gift from Montana to New York State flowing into the Mississippi, then flooding for 7,000 years and creating this land. When we stopped the river from flooding, we choked off that source of sediment and the land began to naturally sink as a result. And this is what's causing this area the size of Manhattan every year to be erased from the coast. And it makes hurricane damage more likely because basically the Gulf of Mexico is moving north as the coastal land of Louisiana crumbles and disappears. And, and why were the levees put into place? Was it for, because of uh, commercial reasons or shipping? Why did that happen? Well, when the French first arrived in the early 1700s, one of the first things they did in New Orleans is put up crude levees because they didn't want their children to drown. They didn't want their crops inundated. They didn't want their homes flooded. I mean, it was a natural, you know, rational response. But over time, you know, when you alter something as ecologically huge as the natural flooding of the third longest river in the world, then you're going to get other unintended consequences equally as huge. And one of those is now what we know to be catastrophic land loss. So Louisiana has lost a million acres, an area the size of Delaware has just turned to water in coastal Louisiana between New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico just since World War II, which you can imagine, Katrina, it was a record surge, 30 feet of water in large part because there was very little to slow her down. And we still have that problem. The land is still sinking. We haven't repaired those wetlands, and, and there is a way to do it. Plus, and this story hasn't gotten out as much since the oil spill, the oil and gas industry scissored about 10,000 miles of canals and channels through these same wetlands from World War II to the present, and that caused a lot of erosion. In fact, about a third of the land loss in coastal Louisiana is from oil and gas activity in the marshes, not the offshore stuff that we're looking at now, but the previous stuff that caused also lots of erosion. So what, what, tell me about the marshlands in general. So they're obviously disappearing along with the, the, the rest of the Louisiana coast. Yes, the marshes are, you know, if, you, if you've been to Louisiana or flown over it or look at a map, you see those little swamp symbols and, and maps. Most of South Louisiana is grassland. It's, it's wetlands. It's, it's salt marshes. And these are sinking into the Gulf of Mexico and drowning and disappearing. But those grass blades for years and years actually buffered um, New Orleans and the rest of South Louisiana from these storm surges. And, and these grasses are disappearing. I mean, you literally go out there and you see these huge open areas where once it was it was marshland. And why are they so important to sort of the health of, of the country and the health of the state of Louisiana and the environment in general, I guess? Almost half of all the coastal wetlands in America are in South Louisiana, and they are the, the, the nursery for shrimp, for crabs, for, you know, something like 97 percent of all the commercially important uh, fish and crabs and shellfish in the Gulf of Mexico are dependent at some point in their life on marsh grass. So if that grass disappears, you have, you know, lots of impacts on fisheries. You have lots of impacts on human communities. You lose that coastal buffer against hurricanes. Um, and now this oil spill is starting to seep into these marshes. And unlike that Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska where it went on to a rocky shore. This is a marshy shore, so the grass literally absorbs the oil, it goes down into the roots and causes the death and decay of these marshes. So it could be a really big impact on these vital marshes. And, and not only the vital marshes, but the, the, the wildlife that inhabits these marshes, right? And they're very, there's some indigenous birds and fish that are, are really in danger anyway without this oil. Do you think we're going to have to We'll, we'll see many of them completely disappear? Well, there are so many migratory species that come up from North America or come down from the Arctic and they, they nest in coastal Louisiana or they need that habitat, that food as they cross the Gulf of Mexico. They're exhausted on their way north. They land in South Louisiana this time of year in April and May. And um, it's a vital habitat for so many species, including the brown shrimp, uh, that are so vital to seafood markets in the country, you lose those marshes and you lose those species. You either lose them in numbers or you lose them outright. So you're looking at impacts to cerulean warblers, birds, you know, you've got impacts on brown shrimp. Um, and it's brown, a, also the brown pelican, right? The brown pelican, which has made a comeback, but it's the state bird in South Louisiana, totally dependent on marshes. So you're talking about lots of impacts on people and wildlife. Can anything be done as as this oil 
continues to, to move towards the shore to protect some of these species? Well, I mean, those of us who are old enough to remember some of the bigger oil spills in the 60s and 70s, we, we remember the iconic images of the oil-soaked birds that are then rescued and cleaned, and, and, and that's still possible. But I mean, before possible. that happens. Well, you've, you've got these, you've, you, you can't relocate the species. I mean, they're, they're there, they're going to stay there uh, as long as they can. You, you've got the, you know, the oil booms that are, that are absorbing some of the oil as it gets close to the marsh. But, I mean, given the, the, the stormy weather that's inevitable, um, there are many, most coastal observers believe there are going to be some serious and permanent impacts no matter what we do. In fact, Infinity Girl act, uh, tweeted that question about what is being done to save, save the wildlife. Um, Dee Bradley Kent asks on a tweet, with the summer tourism season approaching, how do you feel this will impact the uh, Florida and Gulf states' tourism business? It's already impacting the tourism business. I mean, you talk to hotels and restaurant managers along the coast of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, they'll say that, that people are staying away. No one wants to take their family to a potentially blackened beach in Pensacola, et cetera. So this is already having a psychological impact on people's spending choices. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the tourism business along, you know, just Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the west coast of Florida is a multi-billion dollar industry. If, if the spill, God forbid, becomes hemispheric, as some people have said, and gets to the east coast of Florida, Georgia, et cetera, it's just going to grow. Um, so, you know, again, I get back to the issue of, you know, the cost of business. You know, is this really tolerable? Do we really want to expose ourselves as a nation to the, this sort of oil spill this on this scale when there are alternatives? I mean, there was just a study in my state of Maryland that showed that my state could get two-thirds of its electricity from offshore wind farms. The state of Virginia could get at least 10 percent of its energy from offshore wind. Again, it's clean. It's renewable. Uh, when those things, God forbid, get knocked over, there's no pollution whatsoever. How do you feel about nuclear power? Obviously, there's a risk resurgence and, and the desire to rely increasingly on, or rely more on nuclear power. I know France gets 80 percent of its energy from nuclear power plants. How do you feel about that as an option away from offshore drilling? Well, France gets 80 percent of its electricity from, I mean, yeah. from nuclear rate. Um, I am not an anti-nuclear um, activist. I'm a pro let's solve global warming and get on the clean energy activist. Um, and the problem, as I see it, with nuclear power is it, it just really is expensive. I mean, Wall Street has never privately financed a single nuclear power plant in America. It's always required government subsidies, ratepayer subsidies, because it's expensive. It's really expensive. And, you know, for the price of one nuclear power plant, you can do a lot more wind power. Certainly, you can invest in home weatherization, efficiency, and things like that. So if I, re if I thought that nuclear was the fastest way to turn off the carbon dioxide spigot and solve global warming, um, I'd say build it next to my house. I have a 12-year-old son. Build it next to my house. The problem is it's just very, very expensive, and you can do a lot more and go a lot further with efficiency, wind power, and other, other forms of energy. I just want to close by getting back to sort of the, the whole premise of your book. What do you think, if, if Louisiana and the coast of Louisiana is disappearing at such an alarming rate, and these marshlands are so critically important to to American wildlife and migratory patterns, if you will. You know, clearly this oil spell is only exacerbating an already existing problem. I mean, what do you suggest be done to protect the coast of Louisiana and the wildlife and really all the land attendant to that state? You know, Louisiana and the people there, they're just long-suffering souls. I mean, we had Katrina in 2005. Now we have this uh, unimaginable disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. A friend of mine uh, says that human beings only learn things the hard way. You know, it took one world war in Europe wasn't enough to sell Europeans on, on peace. I think that as historians look back on the Gulf Coast of of, of the United States and, and our country, and they see Katrina, and they see that there are good evidence that hurricanes are getting bigger because of global warming, and then they see this oil spill in 2010, um, that there's a shift that's coming, and we're going to become more energy conscious. We're learning more and more about where our energy comes from and more and more about climate change. But Louis that's not going to necessarily save Louisiana, is it, Mike? Well, Louisiana needs a restoration of the wetlands, and the wetlands can be restored. And there are ways to let the muddy water of the Mississippi into these shallow bays of Louisiana in a way that gets that mud back out there and restores the wetlands. Has there been any interest in doing that in well, the there, state? 
There's been a $14 billion plan on the table since the late 1990s. The Army Corps of Engineer, the Engineers is going forward with some of these plans. It's not going fast enough. Mm -hmm. You know, the federal government says we don't have enough money. Uh, it says it's expensive, but expensive compared to what? To oil spills and Katrina-like disasters. We're moving forward in ways to restore the wetlands and barrier islands in, in Louisiana, not nearly fast enough. We're improving the levees not fast enough. Especially um, when you consider it's a football field every 30 minutes? Every 30 minutes. That is so shocking, area by the way. Area size of Manhattan every 10, every 10 months. Yeah, fastest disappearing landmass on Earth. Louisiana needs a lot. Louisiana needs to restore the wetlands, and it needs an end to global warming. And it also needs a way to not have oil spills anymore. And all three of those can be achieved through sustainable ecological practices, save the wetlands, switch to clean energy. It's more sustainable. I think we're learning that our addiction to oil is not, cannot be sustained. It's intolerable. And climate change is just accelerating. So I think that as much as the people of Louisiana and the Gulf Coast are suffering, I don't think their suffering is in vain. The message is starting to get out there. And there's a thread of hope. If you, In my book, By You Farewell, I, I end with a hopeful note that these people, these Cajun people, these Gulf Coast people, I mean, they're out there in their, in their fishing boats right now trying to soak up the oil spill. They want to do all they can. These are people who should be honored and should be saved. And they're telling us something. And that is pay attention and do the right thing. Well, Mike Tibble, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us about this. Uh, your book is called Bayou Farewell, and uh, I really appreciate your time. And are, are, are you bracing for the absolute worst when it comes to this oil spill? Because it is sort of like I described it as an ominous monster. It's just, it, 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 it's sort of impending disaster, but it's really unclear, isn't it? Just how bad it's going to be? Or are you convinced it's going to be a complete disaster? Well, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, I think, is where a lot of us are coming from. I mean, none of us thought that this would be this bad. I mean, if you look at the satellite photography of this oil spill, it's just so huge. I mean, larger than than Puerto Rico in size in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's already outstripped our, our, our ability to comprehend it. Um, could it get worse? Yeah. Uncertainty is one of the scariest factors of this whole thing. I think no matter what, we have a lot of pain in the bank from this already. That oil is going to come ashore. It's going to have impacts. It's already having impacts on commercial fisheries and tourism. Now we have to contain it and learn the right lessons. You know, we have to learn the right lessons. We can't let another disaster go by without learning what the best next step is. All right. Mike Tidwell, thanks again. Nice to talk to you. And thank you all for tweeting us your questions. And you can see all the episodes of our web show anytime at cbsnews.com. And now stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Dove.